Hello, and welcome to this Analyst Angle. I'm Bob LaLiberté, Principal Analyst with The Cube Research. And today, I'm joined by Zias Carafala, Principal Analyst of ZK Research. And we're here to discuss the results of a collaborative research project we did between our companies titled The Impact of AI on Networking. Welcome, Zias. Hey, Bob. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's good to be on this side of the, of the, the desk. On, yeah, it's great, enjoy webinar, yeah. great to have you on to, to an analyst angle. Yeah after doing all the ZK, Zcast yeah. review, so thank you for that. Um, but let's get started. So, you know, we're talking about AI and networking. That can mean a lot of different things. So maybe you could explain to the audience what exactly we did research as, as it relates to AI. Yeah, well, there's two sides to the AI networking coin, right? There's, and we've talked about this before, but there's AI for networking, which is using AI to help me run my network better. Right. That's AI ops, if you will. And then there's networking for AI, which is the no underlying network that supports these AI clusters, right? And the people spend an awful lot of money on their GPU enabled systems, and they got to invest in the network as well in order to, uh, to have that run optimally. And what we look, tried to look at here was both sides of that coin. In fact, um, we didn't get too much into this, but I think that would be interesting research to follow up on is uh, I, it's kind of my thesis that running an AI network is so difficult that I think you need AI for networking to do networking for AI. Uh, but uh, the, the data, you know, certainly showed positive direction for both, right? Which yeah. is what we expected to see. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that latter part, that networking for AI has become more important as the surge of generative yeah. AI environments and workloads are being created and people recognizing the importance of the yeah. network. What was interesting too, was that the data showed we asked the drivers of networking and supporting AI workloads was the biggest networking challenge today, right? And I, I wasn't expecting that. Actually, I was I was still expecting security to be, so to trump security actually is pretty significant. That shows how far along we are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've seen that, I think, consistently throughout the spring. It, yeah. it, up until now, the last six years, security's been the top issue. Yeah. And the generative AI movement has certainly surpassed that, I think, yeah. certainly for the fall. But it does support the thesis that you need AI for networking to do networking. To do networking for AI, yeah. absolutely. And just for a little context about the research, this was uh, 600 enterprises, so 1,000 employees and up. Uh, respondents were across the US, UK, and Ireland, and the majority of them were either senior IT managers or IT managers. And it was across all different industries, and the data was collected in June of this year. Yeah, it was a good healthy mix. We didn't have any more than maybe like quarter in one vertical, so we, we had a really good mix of verticals. To Correct, yeah, nice, nice respondent yeah. poll. Uh, so let's dig into the results. We'll start with maybe the, some of the high level general takeaways. What were some of the things that struck you from just a, a general networking response? Yeah, I think it's the fact that we need AI today. When you, when you look at the data, um, the majority, almost all the respondents said the network is more important to business operations than it was two years ago. Yeah. And, and that is a consistent theme that I've heard over and over from, from CIOs and even business leaders. The network is more important. But an almost equal number of respondents said the network is more complicated than it was two years ago, right? So think about that, Bob. Yeah. We've got more important and more complex. Well, that's two diverging lines that, that sets up really poorly if you're a network engineer in the future, right? And, and so how do we close that gap? How do we simplify but still be able to deliver on the importance? And that to me is AI. Yeah, and I think what we see when we think about what's driving a lot of this complexity is the fact that the distributed nature of the environment yeah. is so much more complex, right? It was a lot easier when everything was, you had your, your castle and moat environment, yeah. right? All that thing was, everything was in the data center. Now you've got applications across multiple public clouds, across multiple private data centers, co-location facilities, and edge locations. So that distributed nature is certainly making it a lot more complex for organizations, but at the same time, critically important to ensure that all that data from those applications and all those different areas are able to be used to deliver better business insights. Yeah, and that it's, it's, it's interesting because that raises the question, what is your network, right? It's not that mode anymore. Is it, does it extend to Bob Lillibridge's home? Does it extend to the cloud, right? Then the answer is yes to all those things. In in fact, for if you're um, uh, you know a, a vertical that has a big fleet, it extends up to those fleets today, right? So you've right. got autonomous vehicles and even you know vehicles with drivers and and the, so the concept of what your network is has grown tenfold. Correct. Uh, but budgets certainly haven't kept up with that, have they? No, yeah. no, they, they certainly have it. And so as a result of that, you've got 
fewer people or the same amount of people having to cover a much larger, much more complex environment, as you said, distributed, what, what can, you know, constitutes the network. So we see a lot of organizations trying to modernize it. There's a much greater focus on performance and experience yeah. as a result of that. So a lot of things going on and that's where nice segue, that's where AI yeah. can help organizations, you know, get over that complexity. So maybe we should talk about a little bit part of the research that focused specifically on that AI for networking and some of the challenges, trends, and, and benefits we're seeing. What did you see, what did the data show us uh, came out along those, those, those trends? Yeah. And, um, and I do think AI plays an important role. I, I'll credit uh, uh, Scott Gunnerman from the PGA Tour for saying this uh, uh, to me the first time. He said, AI lets the untrained eye see what the trained eye does. So you think of how companies manage networks historically it was to put a lot of really high priced engineers in the front line, right? And so then they're not doing their normal job of being strategic and thinking about how to evolve the network. They're just out there fighting fires, which isn't, you know, what you want. And so if you look at the data, um, you know, companies are seeing uh, more traffic, yeah. um, broader distribution. Uh, I think one thing that kills companies is multiple different management tools. And it's, and I'm not, and I'm not a believer that we'll ever get down to a single pane of glass. Right. Right. But having those different management tools not talk to each other gives you silos of information. And yeah. a lot of times you're going to get different information. My Wi Fi might tell me one thing, where my campus network tells me another, where my data center network tells me another. And so troubleshooting that becomes incredibly difficult. In fact, one of the data points from my research is that, what well, not from this survey, was that three quarters of trouble tickets are open by the end user, not the IT pro. Right. So that means the IT pro is always working from behind, right? And so when you combine that with, you know, a large part of the audience trying to support modernized applications, we're in this where, you know, com complexity, of course it's grown. Correct. Uh, because it's just a, a much different environment than, you know, when I was a, um, a, an IT pro, we really didn't, we controlled the device you were on, the applications you used, even when you could work remotely, right? Then, right. And now yeah, that's all. That's all gone. That's all changed. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the interesting things for me when I think about AI, I've always been a big fan of trying to understand this time to comfort with new technology. And for AI, it's interesting because it's not just a technology piece, right? That's certainly an aspect of it. What's the efficacy? How good is it? Is it actually working and helping me? The other pieces of it are around the cultural yeah. aspect of it and how well, right? So as you said, right, IT teams, right, especially the operations teams, want to be in control. And so this is something that sort of gets out of their control and they need to be able to trust it and to validate yeah. it and be able to understand it is going to be beneficial to them in the long run. So well, I think that's... There's that expression, right? That everyone's worried that IT, AI is going to take your job, right? But it's not AI that's going to take your job. It's engineer that embraces AI that's going to take your job. Correct. Yeah. This is really about, you know, organizations and it has to start at the top as well, right? So it's not just the operations team. But the executives also have to be able to support this and be able to drive it and be okay with that. Let's give them some time to learn and get comfortable with it before it actually starts delivering results. And I mean, I, I know it's interesting when we talk about the technology, right? It's clearly then we're talking about efficacy and what's going on. And, and from the show spring, the spring show season, you know, it's been interesting to hear some of the real customers coming out and talking about, I remember one event I went to, someone had spent all this time building out their model, training it, doing all this stuff and ended up with 3% efficacy. Yeah. And they were happy because they at least got started. They went through it and now they know what they need to do to improve it. But other cases we've seen, uh, I think McDonald's just recently came out and said they wanted to try and use AI to help with their drive through automation and they achieved 80% efficacy, but for it to make financial sense, it had to be 95%. Yeah. So we're going to continue to see this as what's the ROI, what's the model, where will AI be used? What are the use cases? But certainly the, the key is organizations need to start embracing it. Yeah, it's an interesting question uh, when to bring it in because, in some ways, having it is better than not having it. And it's a little, I use the self driving in the it, car industry as an example. You know, I have lane change alert in my car. I'm sure you do. Is mine better than yours? I don't know, but it's better to have it than not have it. I suppose down the road we might test it, right? Yeah. Now, I do think, though, there is a threshold that companies need to think about of when to bring it in. To me, that's better than people. And so for yeah. McDonald's, I don't think they're seeing 20% error rate in their drive through Correct. Right? But in network operations, the number one cause of downtime, by my research, it's about 30% of downtime is still people-related. Sure. And so 
if you get over that 70% threshold of efficacy, you're probably ahead. It's a, it's a little bit like that. Now, the, and I caution people not to have too much fear when it does make a mistake. It's a little bit like what you see in the, with self-driving cars. If a Tesla has an accident, everybody freaks out. But the rate of accidents is about one every 2 million miles, I think, for a Tesla, where it's about one every 200,000 for people, right? So, um, yeah, and yeah. That's, that's where, I, I mean, one of the questions we asked in this research was around, how are you using AI? Yeah. And the responses we gave were like, hey, I'm, I'm just using it for alerts. I want to get recommendations then either manually or provide automated responses through a manual trigger. And then lastly, I want everything fully automated. And what we've been seeing consistently is the, the majority of respondents are in the camp of, I'm getting to the point where I trust it enough to give me the recommendations as well so that I can then go and either trigger an automated response or manually be able to fix it, which is a good sign, right? We're moving out of the, just give me the alert and I'll go do everything myself to give me some help. I understand, right? As we talked about earlier, things are a lot more complex. Yeah. I don't have an increased budget. So these are the things that are helping me. To get to that fully automated stage, that's where it's gonna take some, I think a little bit more time to, to build up that trust and to validate the technology and the efficacy. Yeah, in fact, I think that was one of the lower responses, right? Fully automated. Well, what was interesting too is when we asked the question, uh, what's your biggest challenge in deploying AI apps technology? The number one response was lack of a single AI engine to cover the entire network. And that, again, underscores the point you made about the network being so much bigger, right? And, um, and, and um, you know, there's an expression in data science, good data leads to good insights. Well, the flip side of that's true, where silos of data leads to fragmented insights. And I think that's what we have today is, yeah. is a lot of siloed systems that give us partial view of what's going on, but not right. a whole deal. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's been, and we've seen the underlying trends that have turned out to be fortuitous for this AI movement. And that being that shift to cloud-based network management, the ability to have more unified management. So those network vendors who have embraced this and built out cloud management systems and have st slowly rolled in, not only the wired, the wireless, the SD-WAN and then the data center, they're starting to reap the benefits of having that single unified data set that they can then plug into that AI engine as well. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think, you know, from, from the data, the good part is, you know, the promising part for AI for networking is that organizations are seeing the results of leveraging this, right? So they're seeing, having better performance, better experiences, less complexity and faster time to identify and fix issues. Yeah, well, that's the ultimate goal is, uh, is be able to identify. In fact, ideally, you'd like them to fix the issues before they become a problem. Right, that would, uh, yeah. Right. yeah, predictive intervention. Yeah. Not just proactive, but going a little bit. Yeah, and the data is there, right? I mean, you can tell from a trending perspective if, you know, your WAN link is, the traffic is rolling every day, maybe users aren't calling with the problem, but you should be able to predict when a problem is going to occur. Yeah. Right, and it, AI can certainly do that much faster than people care. Yep, absolutely. All right, so it's clear that AI and networking um, is going to be more important, even a competitive differentiator yes. uh, for organizations. Uh, and I think that the data highlights that, right? There was a, a stat that we had in there about uh, organizations that were willing to, to switch. So, so this to me, from a vendor perspective, was one of the most shocking data points I've seen in a long time. Yep. So historically, when I run surveys, I always ask about, are you willing to switch vendors? And when things aren't changing in, in traditional legacy markets, that number is like 10, 15% willing to switch. I remember in the early days of SD-WAN, that number jumped to 60% and we saw huge share shift, right? Cisco had 90% share in WAN. Now we have got yep. Fortinet, v, you know, VeloCloud, oh, VMware, uh, who wasn't even VMware. a, yep. they yep. weren't even a network vendor. Correct. Now is one of the dominant SD-WAN vendors. This year, almost 97% said they were willing to switch vendors based on superior AI ops capabilities. And to me, that makes the, the industry wide open today, whether you're a 5% vendor, 50% vendor, you know, th th watch your back because uh, AI ops is going to change the vendor landscape. Yeah, huge opportunity yeah. For, for vendors there. All right, well, let's, let's shift gears now and talk about the networking for AI. Um, you know, maybe we can talk about this because it's interesting because the networking for AI piece, we saw it in the spring show season as well. Suddenly the network was on center stage yeah. in companies where it never was even brought up before. So a lot of, I think a lot of support for these backend environments from a network perspective, what the respondents have to say about this topic? Well, you know, there's, there's certainly, um, um, 
you know, looking at it, they're, they're, they're doing more and more cloud, right. And, and building out their own. I think, uh, um, we asked the question, um, where is your organization plan to use AI, right? And, uh, over half the respondents said they were going to build their own AI environments, one of their own private data centers. And I'm not surprised by that. I do think we're going to do a lot of AI in the cloud. Yep. Uh, but I do think more and more companies want control. Uh, there was also a large percent that were going to do it in the edge and things like that. But those are all places where you need to run your own network. And so I thought that was um, that was pretty interesting. Uh, when we looked at what were some of the the, 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 the reasons somebody might use a public cloud, it was just data and privacy concerns. But yep. I think that's always the case early on. Correct. And then we start to realize, no, we can do security just as well. But we're pretty close to having, um, when you look at the, the, the timeline we asked, 61% um, you know, said sometime in the next 12 months, right? Correct. Uh, and uh, so networking for AI is coming and it was good to see it's so well represented in the in the, in the the trade show season this spring. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when then the other, so that brings up the next question that we asked about, which is, okay, well, if you're going to have networking for AI in environment, what are you going to deploy? Is it going to be an InfiniBand network or Ethernet yeah. network? And I think in, in our case, again, we saw from a from an enterprise perspective, leaning towards the ethernet. Yeah, I think everybody wants ethernet, right? I don't think there's any question if you can just ask the world to get rid of every other protocol but ethernet, they would. The, the question is, can the ethernet vendors actually deliver the performance of InfiniBand, right? And historically, these other ethernet, we'll see if Ultra Ethernet does, but with these other attempts to disrupt InfiniBand haven't worked now. With that being said, InfiniBand's a cap market, right? It's not growing. And in a lot of cases, when you buy it, like, you know, in a DGX system or something, it's embedded in there. You don't even really know it's there. Right, right. Um, but but I do think the preference, if every all things being equal, the preference would be Ethernet. Yeah, and I think we're starting to see more and more industry groups coming together to solidify, like you said, the Ultra Ethernet consortium yeah. and, and so forth. And there's other things for the open links, right, to replace the NV link to provide a more open piece. So I think there's a lot to, to come out on there. Of course, the, the research we did has a lot of the data on why organizations are doing one versus the other. So I did I did think it was interesting that that question where we asked, why would you choose one versus the other? The majority of respondents, the number one response for InfiniBand was, we believe it has better performance. Right. Where the number one response in Ethernet was, because we use Ethernet everywhere else. And so you can see it's a simplicity versus performance argument. And if you... That's always the trade-off, right? Do I give up uh, um, performance for simplicity? I, I don't think you can do that in with AI. And this is where all the internet vendors, they need to perf to prove that they can perform at InfiniBand levels. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. We talked about the whole unified, right? And now we're adding a new domain. These back-end, yeah. right, back-end AI networks are essentially a new, right? You could group it as somewhat maybe part of the data center, but it's its new environment. So again, yeah. it adds more complexity. People need to learn the skills and so forth. And that's where having, you know, we're starting to see now as organizations coming out with validated designs yeah. to help accelerate the adoption. Yeah, and uh, and actually that's an important part because that we asked, how can the vendors help you feel more comfortable deploying Ethernet? And the number one response there was to create validated designs. And, yeah. and to me, this isn't, you know, this playbook's been used before. If you think of the early days of, um, uh, of hyperconverged or converged infrastructure, right. VCE just came out of nowhere because it was a pre-built, fully integrated system where all the dials were tuned and That's the, right. you know uh, levers were pulled, and so that helped c customers get deployed. I do think one of the interesting data points on for InfiniBand supporting it though was a good healthy chunk of the audience had because NVIDIA use it, sure. and and they have grabbed so much of the, in the, the AI spotlight. Yeah yeah, 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 and that's why all these partnerships you're seeing the network vendors have with NVIDIA become Absolutely. important. Exactly, yeah, So, and it provides choice as well for organizations. And again, because they don't want to have the complexity of having to have their team learn a whole new. So if Ethernet can provide the performance that's required from end to end, and that goes beyond just the switches and even into the, the NIC cards as well, then it provides a, a viable alternative for them to reduce the complexity while still maintaining the, maintaining the performance that they need. Yeah, yeah, a pretty big chunk of the audience said we have no InfiniBand skills in house, right? Yeah. So, that's, yeah, so that's going to be a big problem. So, awesome. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on today. That's all the time we have for this. So, thank you for for watching this um, analyst angle, and certainly uh, want to thank my special guest Zia Scarafala. 
from ZK Research for this. And if you're interested in learning more about the research Zias and I conducted, please reach out to either Zias or myself and we'd be happy to talk to you. Thanks very much. Thank you.